have a quorum. Uh, let me double check. Yes, you do. Thank you. The time being 5.01, um, September 16th, 2020, I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Bourne. Here. And just to note, Commissioner Bourne is in the boardroom, so I can visually see Commissioner Bourne. Thank uh, you. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, Commissioner Hassan, yep. Hello. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. Present. President Cogill. Commissioner Severson. Vice President Vita, you have a quorum. Thank you. I would like to move. Uh, I, I would like to move for approval of the agenda with the removal of uh, resolution 2020-296. So moved. Wait, why? Why do you want to remove 296? Um, we can have Assistant Superintendent Schroeder give us. Um, I think we need to vote. Uh, on we need a second first. And then we can have a discussion around why it's removed. I'll second. Thank you. Um, now we can have Assistant Superintendent Schroeder please uh, give us an update on why we are removing 2022-96. Acting President Vita and Commissioner Meyer, that believes we continue to work with the City of Minneapolis and the Watershed District to come to a more amenable solution regarding operations and maintenance than what we have in the current agreement. We've been talking with them fairly consistently over the last two weeks and would like to have more time to be able to fully address that. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Meyer? Yes, it does. Um, Any further I, I, discussion? I, I guess I do, I do wish I had been informed of that as the district commissioner, but um, I will I accept the agenda as is. Thank you. Any further discussion on the removal of resolution 2020-296? Secretary, will you please take the role on the adoption of the agenda? Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Acting President Vita. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. I would ask for a motion for approval of the for uh, approval of the minutes of Wednesday, September second, twenty twenty. So moved. Second. Uh, Secretary, will you please take the role on approval of and, the minutes? And just a point of order: Is Commissioner Bourne's um, visual and, and micro microphone on? We're not seeing or hearing. Commissioner Forney, um, Commissioner Bourne is in the boardroom. So it presents a question of um, whether or not we can get a camera on Commissioner Bourne outside of a laptop. Uh, Secretary Ringgold, for the audio, I'm, I'm supposed to use this microphone, correct? Correct. Okay. 
We can hear you now. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Okay. Okay, we're moving for approval of the minutes, please, Secretary. Um, we have a we have a motion and a second, so yep. we need uh, Commissioner Bourne. I'm sorry, this is on approval of the minutes. Correct. Um, yes. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. <coughs> Commissioner Meyer. <coughs> Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Acting President Vita. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. And now we are moving into reports of officers. I'm going to turn it over to you, Superintendent Van Gore. Uh, thank you, Acting President um, Vita and commissioners. Thank you for your time. Um, I will start with uh, a um, Report of officers, I believe here. And uh, we will start with superintendent highlights for September 16th today, 2020. Um, I will begin, uh, I think the slides are up, which is good. I will begin with athletics, aquatics, and ice arenas. Uh, we have some great things that are happening, so bear with me as I get through these. It's uh, really good to get reports in of all the wonderful things that we're doing in the park system. So youth, youth sports. Um, Youth flag football and soccer games begin this weekend with 52 teams in flag football and 137 teams in soccer. Really impressive. Adult sports, fall softball and kickball is up and running with 102 teams participating. Registration for fall uh, session two is underway with 79 teams currently registered for softball and kickball. Uh, recreation volunteers, 77 youth volunteer coaches were certified to coach flag football and soccer. In aquatics, the Minneapolis Public Schools swim team began practicing at Phillips Aquatic Center this past Monday. There are 40 girls on this competitive swim team. Ice arenas, Ath athletics and aquatics uh, staff teamed up with uh, the ice arena staff last week to do much needed landscaping and cleanups at parade and Northeast ice. Uh, below is a before and after, I'm not sure if the screen is changing, so I apologize. Uh, thank you. Uh, below is a before and after photo. Uh, thank you to all the staff who worked hard to improve the outside area uh, of the arenas. Golf, although last week was slower because of the weather, uh, golf courses continue to have a strong year. Uh, as of September 6th, golf has surpassed the 2019 end of season totals for rounds of golf and related revenue. So of course, golf has been doing outstanding this year. Very proud of the work that the team has done. Um, great news. Uh, recreation centers and programs. Nine recreation centers are currently open for rec Recreation Plus. And another 25 will open for programming focusing on youth beginning as soon as September 21st. Recreation staff are excited to begin offering inside programming for the children of Minneapolis once again. And if you look at all the things that are happening, we are kind of getting back into a little bit sense of normal, which is really exciting. Youth development. Village Parks Language and Cultural Learning Program has been offered in partnership with Concordia Language Villages since 1998. Due to spatial distancing requirements, the program will, will begin in the fall of this year, accepting applications now through October 9th, rather than in February, and it will continue through June 2021. Youth ages 14 to 17 will do both virtual and spatially distanced activities at Martin Luther King Northeast um, and North Commons. Full service community school update. Bethune Community School hosted back to school events for the start of the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, we hosted an in-person open house in the school parking lot. 150 of families attended and were able to meet their students, teachers, pick up class materials, 
and receive school supplies. They also are able to receive informational um, uh, from partners about fall program opportunities. Bethune is also launching a community participatory evaluation team this week. They will be uh, a team comp comprised of Bethune parents and family members, community partners and staff. Participating uh, participants will create a unique data collection process to determine if the FSCS is serving the needs and wants of the community. Uh, forestry. Forestry crews are wrapping up ash tree removals at Theodore Worth Golf Course. Uh, many of the trees threaten adjacent golf greens. Uh, knowing that snowy weather is getting closer, this is the perfect time to finish the removals in order to avoid interference with low pet activities. Asset management. Over 22, uh, our, our 2020 aquatic plant harvesting program on Cedar Lake, uh, Lake of the Isles and Bidet Makaska and Lake Harriet started on June 22nd and ended on August 31st. In total, our staff harvested 179 flatbed trucks loads of plant material in 2020. For comparison, 140 loads were harvested in 2019 and 159 loads were harvested in 2018. Great work by that team. Uh, environmental management. As of Tuesday, September 8th, the Bidet, McCosca, Lake Harriet, and Lake Tacoma's boat launches are open to the public from 6 a.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. daily. Boat launch hours will change to 7 o'clock a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. daily on October 13th which marks the start of the all on call program that coincides with the yearly removal of all buoyed sailboats. Uh, launches will close for the season on December 1st. Uh, it has been a record breaking year for the AIS inspection this year. The MPRB's watercraft inspectors have performed 8,077 aquatic invasive species inspections between May 1st and Labor Day. As a comparison, inspectors performed a total of 5,304 inspections during the entire May 1st to December 1st season last year. That's over 3,000 more inspections. So congratulations to Tireless Work and those guys do a fantastic job out there. So thank you to our AS inspectors and in keeping our, our lake safe. Great work. Cedar Riverside Recreation Center redesign or pre-design. The Cedar Riverside Community Advisory Committee meeting number five is scheduled for Tuesday, September 22nd from four to six o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Staff will release a draft of the pre-designed report and answer any CAC and public questions related to the project at this time. Uh, Cedar Isles Master Plan. The Cedar Isles Community Advisory Committee held two public meetings in July and August to discuss how to proceed forward with the Community Advisory Committee CAC for the Cedar Lake, uh, Cedar Lake, Lake of the Isles Master Plan amidst COVID-19 and other challenges our city has been facing this year. It was decided that the project will proceed forward uh, with the first series of CAC meetings and engagement this fall and winter. Uh, the first CAC meeting discussion access will be held on Tuesday, September 29th at six o'clock p.m. Please look for meeting details on the MPRB webpage under Master Plans, Cedar Isles. Phelps Playground uh, Renovation. Work is continuing uh, on the renovation of the playground at Phelps Field Park. Uh, new playground equipment and play areas, uh, play area surfacing is being installed, including over the mound shown in the photograph. Uh, completion of these improvements um, is expected uh, to be in the fall of 2020. Improvements to the athletic field using Hennepin Youth Sports Program Fund and a new splash pad will begin in the spring of 2021. Very excited about what's happening at Phelps. So great work and again, uh, excited about the progress that we're seeing uh, at Phelps. Uh, Morgan Avenue Tennis Courts, uh, one of my favorites, I love tennis. So this is good to hear. After more than two years attempting different methods of achieving a contract for improvements, the Morgan Avenue tennis courts located within the Minnehaha Creek Regional Trail are finally under construction. Support the courts, a frequent partner of the NPRB, focused on rehabilitation of the tennis courts, has a contract for construction 
of the playing surface and NPRB resources are being directed to removals, grading, fencing, and other finish work. The courts will be ready for play in spring of 2021, and I will be on those courts. I still have to get the fall wall though. So great to hear that. Uh, plank trail under construction. Plank trail construction uh, on the Riverside only is underway. This year's work replaces approximately 392 uh, lineal feet of planks. Uh, the contractor has completed demolition and is preparing for concrete work and to install the new planks. The construction project is anticipated to be completed in mid-November. Great work there. So Crown, uh, Crown Hydro LLC. On Tuesday, legal counsel for the NPRB filed a motion to intervene in Crown, Crown Hydro LLC versus Federal Energy Regulatory Commission allowing the park board to be considered a party to the case and its positions to be heard before any proceedings in the case. The city of Minneapolis joined in the park board's motion. Since 1995, the park board has opposed the introduction of Crown Hydro's electrical generation facility at various locations around the falls of St. Anthony. Crown's latest proposal would locate hydroelectric facilities on core of uh, engineers' property, uh, but would negatively impact the aesthetics, recreation, and historic interpretations of the Central River, Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park, as well as the economic development and potential of areas surrounding the park. Put simply, Crown's project is not compatible with the plans for the park board and the city of Minneapolis. The action currently under consideration is an appeal by Crown Hydro after the after FERC rejected Crown's proposed financing plan and dismissal of an amendment offered by Crown. The park board and the city continue to, to oppose Crown's plans with an ongoing um, but uh, unrealized effort impeding plans to continue improving the park and other public amenities in the area. Memorial to survivors of sexual violence Construction of Boom Island on the nation's first permanent public memorial to honor survivals of sexual violence is almost complete. Uh, this public art memorial space uh, was proposed by the nonprofit company Break the Silence and was approved by this board in 2017. More than 1,000 individuals and organizations donated to fundraising efforts to make this memorial a reality. Planning staff have partnered with uh, Break the Silence to design and construct the memorial, which includes a circle of benches surrounding a small gathering space, new trees and landscaping, and three monuments with mosaic art by local artist Lori Green. The memorial depicts two prominent metaphors, mosaic and the ripple effect. The mosaic represents that even broken pieces uh, can be put together to create something whole and beautiful. The ripple effect represents the multiplying power of breaking the silence. By telling our stories, we unconsciously give other survivors permission to tell theirs. A dedication to the memorial is planned for next weekend in order to maintain social distancing and to, to respect social gathering restrictions. The dedication will be filmed and then streamed publicly via Facebook Live on Saturday, October 10th, 10 o'clock a.m. Learn, learn more at www.survivorsmemorial.org. And so, so excited about that. I, ah, so happy. Um, with that, I believe I will turn this over to um, Director of Finance, Julie Wiseman, for a quick financial update. Thank you, Superintendent Bangora. Good evening, uh, Acting President Vita and Commissioners. I'm here to provide you with my monthly 2020 financial um, update. And I have a lot of changes uh, to happily report um, at this time. So if you can advance the slide. For the general fund, the biggest changes are now coming forward through uh, the federal, uh, federal and state uh, emergency response funds and COVID response funds and CARES Act. So 
So you'll see that the city of Minneapolis, or we understand that the city of Minneapolis received $32.2 million of CARES Act federal funding. There, an agreement was reached between uh, the mayor and the superintendent, which provided for uh, the park board to become a sub-recipient of that city CARES Act funding in the amount of $2 million. So for our general fund, we're reflecting $1.7 million, and then you'll see a small amount in the enterprise fund for the City Cares Act funding. We've had one meeting with staff, and our second meeting is scheduled for next week as we meet um, and provide um, actual expenses that qualify for the Cares Act funding reimbursement. You also see the um, the receipt of 400 and just under $500,000 from the Hennepin County CARES Act funding for youth programs. We have uh, Minnesota COVID uh, relief coming from uh, public health, uh, state public health uh, for our Rex Plus Child Care program. And then of course the Minnesota ESP fund for encampment. So with all those uh, revenue sources coming in, uh, our revenue less expenses for our general fund um, is just shy of $500,000 um, as a deficit, which we will use fund balance to cover if you advance the slide. So that uh, leaves our fund balance at a level that is sufficient for any future storm events uh, and meeting our financial management policy and potentially providing some one-time relief moving going into the 2021 budget development process. The next section is the enterprise fund. And uh, we are really happy to report that the Gulf um, operations has continued to boom. The weather has continued to cooperate. August, we had $500,000 more in revenue uh, than we had in August of last year. August is actually the highest revenue month that we have seen since uh, around 2004. And Gulf has a very high chance of bringing in at least $7 million in revenue uh, for the first time since 2001 if the fall um, continues to look as, as good as it's looking right now. Uh, if you advance the slide. So on the other operations, youth and event permitting, again, we're bringing in smaller amounts of revenue for small events that comply with the COVID restrictions. Concessions is bringing in revenue, but at a slower pace and at a lower level than uh, last year due to COVID. Parking revenues, we saw some significant reductions. We received a report uh, today that shows that August and so far in September that parking re revenues seem to be stabilizing. We have um, more users at a smaller, um, paying a smaller amount. So, um, so we're looking to potentially raise um, our revenue estimates and parking as we go forward into September and October. Our ICE arenas, we've been able to um, adjust our revenues there based on the socially distanced programs that are currently happening in our ice arenas. If you advance the slide. So we have a large shift and change from the previous uh, forecast in the enterprise fund. We are showing a $1.2 million net income in our operations, uh, which is a significant um, significant improvement over previous forecasts. And with our non-operating revenue and non-operating expenses, uh, we feel that our net income is going to cover our expenses this year and we will not be having to dip into unbalance uh, in the enterprise. 
So that's the end of my presentation, if there's any questions. Uh, Acting President uh, Vito, we do have uh, one more uh, section which goes through our encampment presentation, but depending on time, maybe we can ask your questions now and then come back to um, the updates around um, the encampment maybe after open time. Uh, I, I take directions from you though, of course. Um, that works for me. Uh, I see that Commissioner Bourne has his hand raised. Do you have a question, Commissioner Bourne? Um, I do, but it's a uh, general um, reports of officers question, so it can wait until the, it's not on a specific topic we've covered yet, so it can wait until the, until the end. Okay. Okay, thank you. I also want to say that uh, President Cogill is attending a BET meeting, the Board of Estimate and Taxation, and that is why I'm presiding over tonight's meeting. I'm sorry I didn't say that uh, when we opened the meeting, but he should be joining us sometime. I'm not sure when, but um, he will be joining in. Very soon. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Hello, President Cogill. Hello, Vice President Vita. I, I'm just logging in, so I'll, I'll let you continue um, for a few minutes here as I get set up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're moving into open time, so when you get set up, we'll just move right into that. I think it's 527. I'll just um, insert that. Thank you, um, Finance Department. Those are wonderful, wonderful accomplishments. It's oof, <laughs> a sigh of relief that we're doing a lot better than I think all of us um, a few months ago thought we were going to go. Um, you know, thank goodness for all these other resources of the federal, the state, uh, Hennepin County. It, it, it's just Wow, <laughs> a sigh of relief. So thank you, uh, Director Wiseman, for your, your amazing work and staff's amazing work. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, thank you Acting President Vita. Uh, I just had a quick question that I'm hoping can get answered at the next executive update. Um, you had noted that we'd had over 8,000 inspections from May 1st to Labor Day at our uh, boat launches, and I'd be interested in knowing of those, how many of those boats did, were found to have um, AIS present on them and what the process was for addressing that to ensure that the lakes stay safe. So I, I realize you probably don't have that information today, but if you could include it in a future update, that would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. I am now going to turn the meeting over to President Cogill. We are at time certain open time. So. Thank you, Vice Thank you President. Oh. Thank you, Vice President Vita, um, and thank you all. Um, it is 5:30, um, and it is uh, now time for open time, which is our opportunity to hear from the public. Um, we uh, have no uh, individuals here at headquarters this evening uh, to testify and we have two uh, speakers calling in. So um, I will uh, get that started here in a moment. First I'll just mention to the speakers who are signed up and uh, called in um, that uh, we uh, are, as I mentioned, this is open time. It's an opportunity for uh, the Board of Commissioners to hear from the public. Uh, you can speak on any topic. We just do not tolerate any harassing or discriminatory language um, or uh, any topics pertaining to uh, pending personnel uh, matters. Um, we do have, it looks like, a few uh, write-in comments as well, but we will start with the um, call-in speakers. Um, I will allocate um, one minute for each speaker. Um, and uh, we'll start with uh, Suzanne Burks, if she is on the line. Is Suzanne on the line? We do not have Suzanne online. Okay. Uh, we'll go to the second speaker there, Paula uh, Chelsea, Tesley. Uh, 
Is Paula Chesley there? They are online now. Fantastic. Paula, if you would uh, go ahead and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, can everyone? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, my name is Paula Chesley, and I live in East Isles. I am calling to speak about the issue of female toplessness. I ask that you repeal the Parks Board Ordinance PB2-21, banning female toplessness in its entirety for all parks. On July 10th, I was cited for toplessness in Theodore Worth Park. I was surrounded by five or six police officers, all of whom were men except one. And I'd just like to share um, some personal memories that this, for me, kind of stands in a, in a long line of. So um, when I was four, this is one of my first memories, I was sitting on a chair with a dress on and my legs were open. And um, I had no idea that this was like inappropriate by societal standards because I was four years old. And my father told me to close my legs and I said, why? And he said, because that's not how little girls sit. So associating behavior with gender right away, um, one of my earliest memories. And then later on, when I was 11, I wanted to wear only a sports bra outside because it was so hot. And he said, I don't think you should. I think you'll get cold. Um, and then later on, he told me it was because he didn't want me just wearing a sports bra in public. So I believe my father was doing this to protect me. But the same policing of male bodies simply does not happen. It's a small leap from my father's words to the Parks Board Ordinance. This cycle perpetuates shame, fear, rape culture, and a whole host of physical issues that women and trans folks must deal with disproportionately. For me, being topless flies in the face of all of that. It says I am equal to everyone and everyone is equal to me. I would like everyone in our society to not feel ashamed of their body. And unfortunately, some people feel more body shame than others. This ordinance perpetuates the shaming of female and trans bodies, telling them they must cover up what men don't have to. Thank you for your consideration of repealing PB2-21. Thank you, Paula. Um, going back to uh, our, our initial call-in speaker, Suzanne uh, Burks. Is Suzanne there now? We do not have Suzanne online. All right, we'll come back to Suzanne one last time um, after we go through the three uh, write-in comments. Um, our first uh, write-in comment to be read by the Secretary of the Board is from Constance Pepin. Dear Commissioners, I request that you join the growing number of organizations and agencies that ritual ritually recognize the indigenous people upon whose homeland our Minneapolis Park system exists. For example, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board respectfully acknowledges that we are on the sacred traditional land of the Dakota people and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Dakota Ojibwe and other indigenous people in Minneapolis who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. It's about getting people to think critically about where they stand, said Duane Dutch, um, Dacheno, the second executive director of Native Governance Center, the St. Paul nonprofit, recently published a guide to creating a respectful, accurate land acknowledgement. And then that is um, the link is provided. Thank you for considering this request. Thank you, Ms. Pepin. Our next speaker uh, with written in comments is Liz Beyer. I am a parent of Hope Cat of a Hope Academy student, and I live in North Minneapolis. Our school um, serves under-resourced students and their families. Our school community wants to be good neighbors in our location, and we care about the well-being of all the folks who are currently encamped at PV Park. We know these folks need long-term solutions to the host of challenges that bring them to homelessness. And we also are troubled to see that the encampment at the park has been a site of gunfire violent assault, and other safety problems in recent weeks. This park is immediately adjacent to our school, and many students in our school need to walk in and around the neighborhood to get to, to and from school each day. I know that the MPRB has served a notice to vacate, but the encampment remains. Our kids need to be safe 
walking to and from school next week and this encampment is hazardous to our students. The neighbors are on PV Park and the, and the people camping there. I am asking. Thank you, Ms. Beyer. Um, our final uh, written in commenter is Bliss Benson. I am a parent of Hope of a Hope Academy student. PV Park is a beautiful and public park shared by the community in Hope Academy. This brings challenges including the recent homeless encampment and gathering of protesters within the pavilion. I am asking that you please follow through on the relocation of the PV Park homeless encampment. I am asking that the encampment and protesters be relocated in a peaceful manner that respects the dignity of people experiencing homelessness and supports the safety of the park for Hope Academy students and the entire community. I implore you to have the encampment relocated as soon as possible as in-person classes resume September 2nd. My kids as well as all K-12 students in Hope Academy are also doing their regular outdoor recess because, are not doing their regular outdoor recess because you are, of your inability to follow through with this. I don't believe this would happen in a wealthier neighborhood. I'm disappointed and angry. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Um, seeing, I have no other speakers, but I am uh, gonna circle back here to Suzanne Burks. Um, is Suzanne on the line? They're on line now. All right. Suzanne, uh, if you'd uh, like to unmute yourself and you uh, have one minute to uh, address the board. Suzanne, are you there? I am. How are you? I'm doing well. You you may go ahead now you, if you'd like to state your name, if you're comfortable with your address, and you have one minute to address the board. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Suzanne Burke. I'm the director of Phyllis Wheatley Community Center. I live at 1369 Spruce Place in uh, Minneapolis, 55403. I'm calling and, and wanted to bring two things to the attention. Uh, park safety at our center and also um, we had a recent shooting in the parking lot and uh, we really do need increased uh, support from the park police uh, regarding that park safety. Um, the second item is uh, park related activities. Uh, to my knowledge um, there's been no park events or activities in Bethune Park, Gordon Park and a number of other parks. Now we're attached to Bethune so that's my main concern. Uh, we still support children's and families in our center. Um, and so I'm, my concern is that there's been no activities at whatsoever at the park. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. Uh, that, concludes, that concludes our uh, open time speakers. Uh, we'll move back into the superintendent's report um, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Bangora. Uh, thank you, President Cogill and Commissioners. Um, I'll wait for a moment just to get the, the PowerPoint up here, and we'll walk through the update on the refuge spaces uh, to people experiencing uh, homelessness, kind of our uh, update report to the board around our efforts and our work. Um, I'll just begin. So, uh, again, President Cogill and Commissioners, um, you know, I really appreciate again this opportunity to provide an update on park uh, refuge spaces and uh, temporary encampments for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, as we have done uh, since mid-June, I and other staff will provide in, uh, information on a variety of topics uh, with updates tonight on public comments received, uh, the permit process, uh, current encampments, and progress or moving encampment uh, occupants into uh, shelter and housing that would be suitable for uh, winter, winter conditions. So staff continue to work uh, to implement resolution 2020-267, 
which was unanimously approved by the board in mid-July. As of yesterday, there are an estimated uh, 347 tents at 22 park sites, down from 380 tents at the last board meeting on September 2nd. As I've reported, uh, as I've reported over the past three months, I and other park leadership staff have been meeting regularly with our city, county, and state partners. Uh, they have clear and defined responsibility for addressing homelessness. As reported at the board, the last board meeting, uh, letters were sent to these partners last month requesting assistance and housing or shelter for those living in park encampments before the weather turns cold. Yesterday, I provided commissioners with an update on progress uh, towards moving encampment, uh, uh, moving encampment occupants into shelter and housing um, suitable for winter conditions as directed in resolution 2020-267. The update has been posted on our encampment webpage at www.minneapolisparks.org backslash encampments. Tonight, I will highlight a few key points included in that update. In response to our letter, President Cogill and I received a September 4th letter from Governor Waltz. He addressed funding for housing and homelessness in response to COVID-19, including $23 million directed to Hennepin County, the city of Minneapolis, and the park board um, and, nonprofit, and nonprofits operating within the county and city. To date, the park board has received uh, in the amount of $170,000 in Minnesota emergency response funds. The Waltz letter ref references other resources that have been directed to housing and homelessness, the allocation of CARES Act emergency solutions grant funds, and the lack of a request for new emergency shelter capacity and a joint response from the city and county for the CARES Act ESG funds. The letter also references MPRB's Resolution 2020-253, which designated parks as a refuge for individuals experiencing homelessness, noting that it is significant to the extent of the encampments that have occurred within Minneapolis parks. The letter concludes with a reference to the governor's proposal to direct $260 million in housing-focused investments in his bonding recommendations which is currently held up in the legislature. The Minnesota Interagency Council of Homelessness has several state activities underway that support expanded shelter and housing capacity, including millions of dollars in state funding to support new protective spaces, outreach, staffing and supplies, as well as hotel to home uh, models are still currently, I'm sorry, as well as hotel to home opportunities in the Twin Cities. Applications for funding supporting the hotel to home model are still currently available for qualified providers. The state also uh, is also partnering with the county and city to support the new shelter to open in early December that will be operated by the American Indian Community Development Corporation. The city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County are partnering on a number of initiatives. In addition to the emergency shelter opening in December for the city's Native American population, a facility serving medically frail homeless individuals is expected to open next year and a temporary 30 bed women's shelter may open this winter prior to the permanent site next year. They have also provided additional women's shelter beds uh, at the Simpson housing shelter and are providing funding to ensure that existing emergency shelters can remain open 24 hours per day, seven days per week in a COVID safe manner for the next two years. The city, county and state continue to explore possibilities with other projects and initiatives to bring shelter beds online for the winter. Provider capacity has been and continues to be one of the biggest challenges in bringing more capacity online. Partner agency insights uh, relative to shelter and housing opportunities also suggest the pool of available opportunities is growing more limited as the weather becomes colder. On September 8th, following the first cold weather of the season, Hennepin County reported that there were no beds 
for single adult males, uh, 12 beds available for single adult women, and 21 family shelter rooms available. Numbers vary from day to day. As of this afternoon, Hennepin County reports 14 single adult beds for men, 15 single adult beds for women, and 39 family rooms for those with children. Resolution 2022-67 states, sheltering homeless people in Minneapolis parks is not a safe, proper, or dignified form of housing and is at best a temporary solution for encampment individuals before cold weathers arrives. Complicating the shortage of available shelter opportunities is the anticipated date of opening uh, of cold weather shelters, which is typically in December, according to our partners. From the perspective of park, park encampments, the cold weather noted above is already present and leaves encamped individuals exposed to the cold weather for at least 10 weeks. Cold weather poses a threat to those experiencing homelessness, even when temperatures seem mild. Hypothermia can set in when temperatures drop below 50 degrees, but many shelters don't open until it's much colder, according to information provided by the National Health Care for the Homeless, Homeless Council. Complicating the current situation, the MPRB does not allow open fires or the use of propane as a, fu as a fuel for a fire in parks. As a result, the potential for generating heat is very limited for those encamped in Minneapolis parks. Allowing the use of fuels or fire or to create warmth poses a great risk for encamped persons and for park assets. The use of firewood poses a similar danger, not only for the risk of fire, but also, but also introducing diseased wood into park areas. One common way to spread diseases which affect trees is through the use of firewood. The park board spends millions of dollars each year to protect the urban forest and firewood is a real and direct threat to that asset. Park board staff firmly believes that the onset of cold weather should result in the disbandment of remaining encampments during October with the primary goal of protecting those encamped individuals from cold weather. MPRB outreach staff are informing those living in temporary park encampments that they will not be able to stay in the parks when once cold weather arrives and stays, which staff predicts will be in October. Staff will continue to work with their counterparts at the city, county, and state to move those currently encamped in Minneapolis parks to available shelter so that the least possible encamped individuals remain in Minneapolis parks on the date determined for disbandment. With that, I'd like to turn this over to Deputy Superintendent Ringgold for an update on public comments and permits for temporary encampments. Thank you, Superintendent um, Bangora. So as we have for the last um, several meetings, we'd like to give you an update on what we're hearing and how um, kind of what, what's coming in for staff to respond to in terms of public comment. So I won't repeat the items from September um, that came on or before the 2nd of September, but I will focus in on the items that we've received since that time. We've received 158 comments about homeless encampments. 156 of those were received by customer service staff, and two of them came into our open time email. Five were in support of encampments, and 138 were opposed and PV Park was a big focus of the comments we received. 15 of the comments were neutral or were sent as observations. Temporary encampment permit update. We do have 15 active permits. I'll show you a map in just a moment, um, but it includes Beltrami, BF Nelson, Boom Island, Brackett, Franklin Steel, Lake Harriet, Lake Nokomis, Logan, Lindale Farmstead, Marshall Terrace, Minnehaha, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Riverside, and then the Annie Young portion of Riverside and the mall. Um, Superintendent Bangor mentioned this as well, but here are the numbers of current vacancies. 14 single adult beds for men, 15 for females, and 39 for um, families with kids. And I think it's important, as Superintendent Bangor said, these numbers seem to fluctuate 
uh, daily. Here is a map to show you where those temporary permitted encampments um, are within the system and that same list of um, park names along the right hand side. I will now hand this over to Assistant Superintendent uh, of Environmental Stewardship, Jeremy Barrett. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold. Um, good evening, President Cogill and Commissioners. Uh, I will be very brief, go to the next slide. Um, this is an overview of the uh, encampments we've observed throughout the system that are not permitted. And so you'll see there's uh, seven of those, um, Cedar Lake, Lake Harriet, other, Lake Nokomis, other, Lake of the Isles, Lindale Park, and MLK, other, as well as TV. And if you go to the next slide, um, we have an overlay with the permitted sites and the non-permitted. And what I would note is that when we've um, referenced it as Lake Harriet, other, Lake Nokomis, other, and MLK, other, that's recognizing that uh, we have a permanent encampment, but we also have tents um, outside of the designated area. And so um, we have gotten this to the 15 permitted uh, parks and seven uh, parks with, uh, without permits. Um, and I believe that is the end of this, and I turn it over to finance. Yes, so I'll turn it over to Director Wiseman. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, if you advance to the next slide, I just have a brief uh, financial update. Again, on the revenue side, we have the temporary easement, and we have received two payments from the Minnesota Emergency Response Fund for just under $170,000. We have a third request that we will be submitting for $85,000 that will cover expenses through the end of September. On the expenditure side, uh, we have wages and fringe of 105,000. And again, that is uh, maintenance costs associated with the encampments and that is being reimbursed through the Minnesota Emergency Response Fund. We have material and supplies, fists and washing stations. Uh, those are also being uh, submitted for reimbursement through the emergency response funds at this point. We have contractual services for uh, associated with the encampments that includes the Mad Dad contract as well, um, along with legal fees that we are incurring uh, due to encampments and then the site restoration costs. Uh, so at this point, uh, we are breaking even, but again, um, we are receiving an additional, we will uh, potentially be receiving an additional $85,000 from the state of Minnesota. And that's the end of my update. Thank you, Director Wiseman and um, staff uh, for that overview. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from commissioners. I'll start with Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Are we taking questions on the entire report of officers or only this segment at, at this point? We are taking questions on the entire report. Uh, thank you, uh, President Cogill. Uh, Super Superintendent, uh, tonight, uh, we amended our agenda to remove uh, 2020, I think it's 296, the easement to uh, Columbia Golf Course. Uh, when, we, when we spoke last in front of the board, uh, there was some um, question about the timing of bids that had already gone out and it sounded like this evening was the last, uh, was the last uh, meeting that we would have to approve that in order to meet those uh, bid those bids before they expired. Uh, I'm wondering, Superintendent, if there's somebody on your staff that can, is that still accurate or is there still time to meet, is there still time to consider this and still meet those bids? And if so, how much time, when is, when is the hard end? Uh, thank you, President Kogel, Commissioner Bourne. Um, I will uh, turn this over to Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder to uh, answer those questions for you. President Kogel and Commissioner Bourne, I spoke with Doug Snyder of the um, Watershed District yesterday. They've already taken bids 
um, and they have the capacity to award the bids um, without having this um, agreement finally in place. So um, they have, we've learned that we have sufficient time to be able to develop a solution that is more resonant with some of the concerns we've heard uh, from the board over the last several meetings. Um, so that, and that's a new direction uh, for us. So when is the, when is, there's usually an 11th hour and then there's an 11.59. When, when is 11.59? for us to pass this? Uh, President Kocher Bourne, I didn't actually get into that with uh, Executive Director Snyder, but I can get an answer and get that back. He, he didn't seem concerned about a pressing time issue. Okay. So, but I, I will, will get an answer back to you. Okay, so it sounds like we have some time to get this right and have some of those, maybe have some of those holistic conversations we were talking about. Th uh, thank you, Superintendent, uh, or Assistant Superintendent. Um, my, my next question is for, um, I'm, I'm assuming superintendent, you're going to refer it back to Michael again too. Um, there was a report from the follow-up on our last resolution, uh, on the board's last resolution about the Marshall street property. And, um, the, the conclusion of that letter sounded like it was going to take some more work. And, and I, I was confused if staff is looking for more direction as to whether or not to do that work or if um, they are continuing to do it, or if they are continuing to do that work. And if there's, if the board is trying to move forward with pressing the Marshall property into um, homeless relief and homeless support, if, if staff needs additional and clarifying direction, or if they're, or if that's the course that they're on. Uh, go ahead, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Michael, sorry. Thank you. President uh, Kogo and uh, Commissioner Bourne, um, w when that was drafted, we had uh, a response from city staff indicating that rezoning would not be favored. And I had posed the question of a conditional use permit, which they also indicated would not be favored. Um, it, it seemed to me in, in after um, that document was crafted that the conditional use permit is a more likely process that would allow us to get um, to, to achieve that. I did place a call to a uh, city council member, I, I sent an email to uh, council member Fletcher's and his staff to see if I could review that wood process with them. This would be a process that's similar to what we use to get the wood processing um, allowed for a temporary period of time with conditions at 4022 and a half, the Schmidt Operations Center. Um, that process would allow us to do something different with 1828 Marshall with conditions for a limited period of time and without a rezoning, which I think, I think the rezoning is the uh, greater concern for city staff. Okay. And, and so we are moving forward with staff has the wind at their back saying that the board is interested in pressing this property into service for homeless relief. And we're working towards that end still. President Kogo, uh, uh, Commissioner Bourne, uh, how far staff will push this, I think, is a, a question for the board uh, to to, um, to consider. For, for, for me, the um, immediate consideration would be um, asking about a conditional use permit, because from a regulatory perspective, it would seem to be the most direct path to uh, what was discussed um, several weeks ago when this was first raised. Okay. Um, President Kogel, I'm wondering if we can have a follow-up discussion item on getting uh, um, at our next meeting on um, just continuing to move that issue forward. There might be a there might be a few other pathways that we can look at as well. If the city um, if the conditional permit or conditional use permit route isn't being advanced, um, so I'm wondering if that issue may need to come to the board to provide some additional um, additional clarity and direction. Uh, and then superintendent, I, I think my last uh, question on reports of officers is a, is a request on the financial report um, for the homeless encampments. And I, I don't need a answer tonight, but I'm hoping that Director Wiseman, after after the conversations last week about a difference of opinion of how that $94,000 easement was being um, allocated, I, I'd like to not see 
I'd like to see a separate chart of accounts for what what's being charged to that ninety four thousand versus what's being uh, what's being charged to the to the other funds if that if that's possible. Uh, but I don't need a response tonight. Uh, so if we can if we can maybe have that for the next meeting, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, our, ne our next speaker is uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I have some questions for the superintendent regarding the letter that was sent by the governor and also just about some encampments in the district. A couple of questions. Uh, so the governor is saying that is is the governor saying that funds are available and that the county and city are not requesting them for emergency shelter capacity expansion? Uh, President Cogill and Commissioner um, Usage. In a way, yes. Um, what what seems to be the message that we've been hearing is that there isn't a lot of requests coming in for that money. Uh, what seems to be the concern uh, from what I'm hearing is that there's not what they call qualified providers. So there are um, agencies that lift up, like we could say like a Vivo or you know, some of these, these organizations that support um, unsheltered homeless people that can then take them and provide 24 hour, seven day a week kind of care or resources uh, for wherever the needs that um, unsheltered and unhoused, unhoused people have. Um, there's requests for money, but uh, there's a lot of money that's out there, but not enough people to provide those services. So have we so talked with our partners time. about what they're doing to ramp up that capacity? Because right now mm -hmm. we have mothers and their kids living in our parks. Those kids are not in school. Uh, we've got people with serious addiction problems living in our parks that are preventing people from feeling safe in them. Yeah. Uh, we have like a general sense of lawlessness because people are being told, I'm going to stop you from doing something, yet a couple hundred feet away from them, there are people camping in the park, there are people drinking in the park. There are people smoking in the parks. There are people that are clearly violating park ordinances where that's just acceptable. Um, so I, I would like to understand what the city and county who are able to apply for these funds are doing to ramp up their ability to properly shelter people so the parks can go back to being parks and we can demonstrate to the people of the city that if you're going to utilize a park, you need to do so in a way that complies with with the rules and regulations that we put around that experience. Is yeah, that President a conversation that, that, that you are having with our partners? President Cole, with Mr. Misich, every day. Um, okay. So I, I gave facts, right? I gave information. Um, what we are challenged with is that we're park and recreation. We depend heavily on our partners and the availability that they have the expertise. And so we're, we're in a very difficult situation. Um, we know that we have 350 with 340 some tents, right? If you take that one person per tent, and you look at what's really available, we get from the county from Hennepin County today, we understand the concern. I, I have sleepless nights over this. Um, this is really a challenge. Um, we are working with them every day. We're talking to state, we're talking to the county, we're talking to the city. I know the last time I heard that the, the county, I can't remember the number, but they ramped up a number of people that they're employing and bringing into the county resources. I can't give an exact number, but I know there was this effort to bring more people on board uh, to the county. Um, it seems that there, it's almost as if there was a provider then there becomes available housing or available shelter. With no provider, then there's not the push to get the shelter, right? It's kind of a, a vicious circle. Um, so the, the state was clear in what they were offering. The state is clear that they're the providers, they're the resource. Uh, the county and the city are really the ones that the path through happens that we then get, you know, the, the conversation around what we can do as the park system and also throughout the city. I mean, we're not just, it's not just the parks, it's also, of course, county, the city, that are looking for places to be able to put and, and get people into shelter over the winter. We hear that there's a lot of options that, are, that they're working through. They're looking at uh, different places and housing and, and buildings and 
but we're at the we are at the mercy of that decision and that work and so we are working with them every day as soon as i have more information and i can get more information around that of course we will then direct folks to get into those locations i know they're working on it i know they're doing the best they can to uh, get these open but yeah we're we're in a tough situation okay well i'm hopeful at our next meeting that you're able to tell us that that they found a way to to do something to help these people it's yeah I'm just appalled. I'm appalled that people have not, this has been a problem all summer. We have had months as a community to figure out how to deal with this in a way that doesn't involve people living in parks and that it hasn't happened yet. That you're still being told essentially the same thing you were told back in April just makes absolutely no sense to me. So thank you for continuing to, to push the need yeah. to do something for people, it's, I, I just don't even know what to think anymore about this. Um, so I, Commissioner, moving on. Commissioner, I would just assure you, <laughs> I will assure you, uh, and, and everybody that's on that has been with me on these calls, I have been extremely passionate about this. I have pushed, uh, and believe me, I have asked desperately, we need, we need a plan, we need support. I cannot express to you how hard I've been yeah, working through this. So I, I know you've, in, you've put you've put more more than more than any of us probably into trying to get this result, and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm still getting lots and lots of inquiries from constituents about what the story is at Nokomis. People are very concerned that the encampment is within the floodway. Um, we noted that we permitted two encampments, which I'm not entirely sure is true because some people are telling me that we have and some are telling me we haven't. Um, but tonight in the presentation, we said we've permitted two encampments. The two locations I was told are where those encampments are. There aren't actually any tents there. So I would like to understand what's going on with that. Does the encampment there actually have a permit? Why are we issuing a permit? To an encampment to be in a flood in a flood zone that just seems incredibly dangerous and misguided, and we should not be doing that. Um, and then I'm I'm also getting still a ton of complaints about um, noise issues in the middle of the night and um, the volume of needles that are being found throughout Minnehaha Park, particularly around the encampment. Um, folks are very concerned about their kids, their pets, and themselves being exposed um, to drugs that could kill them and um, infectious disease. So I would like to understand what's being done to address those issues at that particular encampment. Oh, I know, um, President Cogill, Commissioner Lisa, so let me just refer to uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringle on the Nokomis one, if she can give a quick update on the permit uh, concerns there, I would appreciate that, and then we can move on to Minnehaha. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Van Gora, President Cogill, and Commissioner Musich. So we do um, technically have two permits at Lake Nokomis. We have a north one and what we uh, would call a west one. Um, the one that's the west that the one, is the one that is visible and you can see, we had uh, attempted to move that to a different location and after further consideration and uh, kind of consideration of the type of flood zone it's in, and um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder may have additional input he wants to have there, and the time of year it is, and in consultation with the county about kind of the relative stability of that encampment, we have um, we recommend and we've ha and we've moved forward with allowing that encampment to stay where it is. Um, especially since these permits are temporary in nature. If this were something that was intended to be more long-term or to extend into a typical flood time of year, we might have a different consideration for it. But considering it the temporary nature of it and the intention of um, the uh, resolution approved by the board for encampments not to go into cold weather, um, it, seemed, it, it seemed like a reasonable next step to leave it where it is. The other encampment is one that we are still working through. So that permit holder had requested um, an encampment that would be 
kind of by the little parking lot north in the north, right along the parkway north of um, Lake Nokomis, we had offered another location, um, the location that you would have seen a map on, which is closer to the recreation center. The permit holder has indicated that that area feels too exposed and um, perhaps not suitable. Um, Today we did notice two tents moved into another location, so we're now working through the permit holder with the permit holder to understand if those tents are part of uh, their permit or if it would be considered a non-permitted area. So we just have some additional work to do there with that permit holder. So we still have people moving into the parks at this point in the year. Uh, Commissioner Musich, we have a lot of movement in parks still right now. As, as individuals are either asked to leave other spaces or something doesn't work out for them, we still have lots of movement within encampments at the moment. And what's being done to address the issues that have been reported with the Minnehaha encampment? I don't know if Superintendent Bangor, do you want me to... President Cook. Go ahead. Yeah, if you want to start, then I can jump in. Uh, if you wrangled, I can do that. But if you want to go ahead and start, I can jump in. Superintendent Bangora, um, President Cogill, Commissioner Musich. So our outreach staff has been working uh, very closely at Minnehaha. There are a couple of things that we've noticed when um, kind of there was a uh, kind of a uh, larger movement of individuals who are in encampments in general to move over to the wall of forgotten natives. We did see a decrease in the number of tents in that location, and we especially saw a decrease in the number of tents that were outside of the encampment area. The permit holder is uh, working earnestly with our outreach staff, um, has recently requested that the encampment area be delineated by a fence to help um, them be able to enforce here's where uh, our encampment is and then also to provide guidance for our staff to be able to help assist them with removing tents that are not within that encampment area. The permit holder is uh, firmly aware of concerns we've had around harassment and other issues in the area and at this point is uh, doing their best to work cooperatively with us. Thank you for the update. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich. Uh, next, we have uh, Commissioner French followed by Forney. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, President Cogger. Uh My question is, I think it's for uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringo. Uh, you had some stats of shelter beds available. How many shelter beds are available for couples, for folks without kids? Like, if you're a couple, you... You don't have kids, I'm sorry. Uh, President Kogel, Commissioner French, um, that's a very good question. I actually, I've reported that information, but I'm not the expert on that information. So I, I'm going to need to see if Superintendent Bangora, who um, works more closely with the county, can help define that. Thank you, Deputy. Go ahead, go ahead, uh, President. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent uh, Ringgold, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner uh, French. Um, I don't have any stats on that. What I do have is single bed families, single for single women, for single men, and for uh, families. That's the report that I was given by uh, the county. Um, so from a park and recreation standpoint, I can only take the numbers and stats that I get from the county. You wouldn't need it either. Sorry. Uh, and report those out. I don't uh, know beyond that. I can follow up with the county and see if there's more information that they can send me, but that's what I received uh, today from the county. Uh, yeah, I'd like that. Uh, also, uh, uh, do we know how many tents have, how many folks have left our parks and, and went to the wall? Are we, are we tracking that? Are we, are we trying to figure out how we can track that? Are we keeping numbers from a day to day or how often do we, do we count tents? Uh, President Cogill, uh, Commissioner French, um, we are not, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have a direct tracking of people that have left from the parks to go to the wall. I do know that the Red Lake has stepped in there and they're doing the um, uh, homeless, or it's called shelter to home 
vouchers that they're providing for uh, the wall and for the folks that are there. I'm not sure how many people are going to be able to receive that. They're going to work there. But I don't have a specific number of uh, people that have left our parks and have moved over to that location. Um, and I would ask Assistant Superintendent Barrett, how often do we get our numbers again that are reported from Roberta? I don't remember the exact dates that we received that. I think we received one yesterday, correct? Every week? Yes, so President Cogo, Commissioner French. Yeah, so we we observe, there's a couple approaches. So the maintenance staff uh, reports on Tuesdays and Thursdays, mm -hmm. uh, tent estimates uh, that they observe throughout the park system. And then the outreach, community outreach team is also on Tuesdays and Thursdays doing a more accurate count within the permitted sites. Uh, but in terms of tracking um, individuals and, you know, the, the tents and if the tent moves from one place to another, we, we're not tracking it at that level. Um, we did notice um, a decrease in the number, at least I did anecdotally in driving by the Minnehaha encampment frequently uh, to and from my home. Uh, I did notice that when the wall uh, became an encampment, the number of temps seemed to uh, decrease at Minnehaha. Um, so, but we are not tracking to that specific level. Yeah. Uh, so, what I'm, on, what I, I guess I'm going to ascertain is, is that um, if, if there, there are some, there are resources at the wall uh, for certain folks, uh, they can go to the wall. They can possibly get housing or possibly get some. We provide a bridge, bridge shelter to housing and, and provide it for them. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, President Cogill, uh, Commissioner French, I'm not sure exactly the specifics around it, but it, it is around more of the indigenous or native population. So it's, it's like Red Lake. So it's not as if um, anybody could go there and, and provide services. I think it's very specific to the provider that is then doing the work with a particular population. Okay, and my last question is about PV Park. Uh, PV Park, I, I, I've, I've been a resident of South Minneapolis probably most of the time that I've lived here in Minnesota. Uh, PV Park uh, is on the corner of Franklin and, and, and Chicago uh, to a very high crime area. And so I'm trying to figure out, is the crime coming from our park or is it coming because it's in a high crime area? which I think the high crime area has always existed before Hope Community was there. And I'm trying to, trying to figure out Hope Community urgency right now because we've always had homeless folks in PV Park. We've always had crime in PV Park. It seems, uh, I don't know, it just, it just, I'm just trying to figure out what, what's different this year. I know there's difference in different parks and different uh, places in our city, but PV Park has always been a, a catalyst for some of these activities that we've, you know, we've tried for years and years to, to, uh, to, 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 to stop it. We put lights out there. We have redone the park. So I'm, I'm just, I just want to know uh, why now, why this year, why, why all of a sudden. I guess that's not a question for you guys. It's just a question I want you to know about there. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner French, President Coley, Commissioner French. Um, if you would, um, I know that this board, we've been pretty clear that uh, crime stats and statistics um, to notice we didn't bring forward today. If you'd like for us to give specifics around incidents that recur within the encampment, we can share that with you. Um, yeah, because you're right, there are, there are I'm sure like things that, I'm sorry? My issue was the things that were happening before the encampment was there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how many of these, how many of the issues that are happening right now mirror, sure. mirror sure. things that were happening prior to the encampment? And sure. That would give me a good way to make an analysis sure. about what's going on. We can on. give, yeah, Commissioner French, we can give specifics around what we know that's happening within the encampment or what's happening around the encampment. I know there was a couple incidents just happened recently um, where a uh, woman overdosed. Um, I think she was in the encampment, obviously. I don't know her oh. current current status, but um, she was in bad condition. I think like sometimes, like you said, you know, they happen there, but that could happen, you know, in the general public. And so, uh, but we can give you specifics to what, what, what's occurring in the encampment. And uh, I, I think, I think, I think you're saying, I'm asking for information about what's happened prior to the encampment. Mm -hmm. What type of, what type of incidents were happening at PB Park sure. prior to the encampment? 
Yep. That I understand you. Yeah, we can we can we can uh, have um, Chief Ahado and uh, we can maybe start to look at what prior instances have occurred to what is occurred now. So we can we can share that with you. I want to know how much we can actually contribute to the folks who are uh, unsheltered. I, I want to make sure they're not being blamed for stuff that that that, that they're not causing. Uh, but yeah, I, I hear you, Commissioner French. Yeah, like I said, that's why I was only giving you specifics that I know that have happened this year in the encampment. I can tell you, then we can look at what's happened previously in the park or around the community so we can maybe share some of that information with you and, and give you some context. Chief Ohado is here today. Chief Ohado is here today, yes, he is. Uh, Chief Ohado, can you give me like a breakdown of what, what like you, prior years, have we always had issues in PV Park? President Cogill and Commissioner French, good evening. Uh, yes, I think your characterization of that um, park and the intersection of uh, Chicago and Franklin is fair. Uh, there's a convergence of, of issues there um, that have always lent to um, crime concerns and problems. I think it's really hard to decouple uh, the encampment from uh, what is going on at the adjacent bus stop um, or just within the neighborhood. Um, one of the things that we see in these encampments is there, there are people in the encampments who are who are vulnerable? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, specifically speaking about PV Park. I don't, I'm that's the only one I'm really going to talk about right now. So there are people in the encampment at PV Park who are vulnerable, um, vulnerable specifically around addiction issues, and there are uh, predators who come to PV Park to capitalize on those addiction issues, and some of that does certainly contribute to crime and violence. Um, but, but you are right, there are many challenges uh, in that neighborhood and at that intersection and at that park. What has the park board done in the past, I don't know, uh, since you've been uh, 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 the chief uh, to interdict some of the violence that's going on and interdict some of the crime that's going on at PV Park? What, what kind of plans have you guys put into place prior to the encampments? So there are um, you know, a variety of strategies that we have used and that we will continue to use. Uh, some of those strategies revolve around enforcement and direct police intervention. Um, we've actually uh, remodeled our staffing uh, to provide dedicated coverage downtown and within Phillips uh, so that you know, in years past, PB Park was just part of um, the entire South Minneapolis beat, which is a very large geography for one or two officers to cover. So we've made adjustments there. Um, but besides police intervention, you know, we continue to work with activating the park um, in coordination with uh, recreation staff at Bell who runs that recreation center, uh, with our community partners, with the neighborhood group, Ventura Village. Um, there, uh, there are cameras within PV Park that the neighborhood um, has purchased. So there are a number of strategies. Um, you know, most recently, PV Park was, was uh, reconstructed. And the hope in reconstruction was to have greater activation of that park um, because a, a busy park is, is often a safe park. And so the more that we can activate PV Park with positive activities, uh, the more safe traditionally it would become. Okay, thank you, Chief Ohana, I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Commissioner thank you. French. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, uh, President Coquill. Um, actually, uh, Commissioner um, French is touching on the same um, issues and ideas that I have, I'm wanting to raise, and that is about um, the, 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 I, I, it's okay if we have the, the crime report or not have the crime report, but the fact that crime is an integral part of this and everything, um, you know, hearing that there was an overdose and particularly hearing that those who found the person refused to bring in authorities, um, paramedics, whatever, to, to, to deal with the woman who overdosed. The same thing happened at Powderhorn with the young girl who was raped. It, anyway, to me, I, 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 I'm sorry, that one always gets me. Um, 
I think it was the most articulate thing. Um, thank you, um, Chief Ohato, and the fact that we need to activate these parks as they were meant to be used. And PD is a, a really critical. I remember when there was the liquor store on the corner and how horrible the crime was in that area. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to see, you know, whatever patterns, I guess, is, is maybe what I'm looking for. And, and I appreciate Commissioner French bringing that up. Um, just a, a, a curious question at Lake of the Isles, who's indicated that there's seven tents. Um, are these tents um, down at the south end adjacent to the, um, the Midtown Greenway? Does anybody know? And the reason why I'm bringing that up is that I have noticed over the years that there usually is a tent or two that is there. And so wondering whether or not these are repeat patterns, we're finding out throughout the city that there's repeat patterns of places and everything and how we can make um, those areas safe zones um, for whomever, for um, whether or not it happens to be unsheltered. Um, it, it, anyway, I just wanted to, to note that we are, as I indicated, pre repeat patterns. And um, I'm so concerned about the crime and about the safety of our unsheltered and that the fact that we have people intervening and not allowing um, people with professional skills to um, be there for them. Um, so thank you all. I, I think probably the most critical thing that I heard or was there, it was in the report that um, uh, Superintendent Van Gore sent out earlier, the fact that the staff capacity has been maximized and we need to resolve this issue. We need to, to bring you know, uh, these people into um, respectful places for them, but also so that we can be about our business. So thank you all for all that you're doing um, once again. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. I'm seeing no other hands raised. Thank you, Superintendent, for the report. Um, and thank you all for the questions. Uh, certainly the, the work of our, uh, of our board and our staff in addressing the unhoused in our parks is not over. Uh, I did feel heartened with the conversation that the superintendent and I and other staff had on Friday last week with the governor's office. Um, however, uh, we, we still are seeing a gap in the number of spaces available um, for folks to go in terms of shelter and the number of folks that are actually uh, unhoused both in Minneapolis and the entire uh, region. So certainly more work needs to be done and I look forward to doing that work in collaboration with all the commissioners on the board. Uh, moving on um, to uh, our consent uh, business, I will ask for a motion on resolutions 2020-301 through resolution 2020-305. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the consent business? Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on the uh, consent agenda items, uh, resolutions 2020-301 through 2020-305. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. I didn't hear Commissioner Bourne vote. Commissioner Bourne. As the secretary, can you repeat my vote? Um, Commissioner Bourne was an aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, the consent agenda carries. Um, and uh, now we'll move into uh, reports of standing committees. Uh, I'll turn it over uh, to Chair Meyer. Oh, actually not Chair Meyer. I will turn it over to uh, Chair Forney. 
Thank you. On behalf of the Admin and Finance uh, Committee, I'd like to move Resolution 2020-300, a resolution approving a ratification of exclusive rights agreement, including expanded language related to the Second Amendment with the City of Minneapolis and the development team led by United Properties for collaborative efforts related to creating a coordinated plan for the Upper Harbor Terminal. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, do commissioners have any questions or is a presentation um, in order from anybody? Any requests for that? Any questions or requests? Seeing none, um, I'll ask the secretary to please uh, take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Absent. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight eyes, one absent. Um, that carries. Um, moving on into uh, petitions and communications, uh, I will uh, start with uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, uh, President Cogill. Um, I received a certified letter from uh, the Laborers International Union uh, Local 363 uh, this afternoon about uh, labor relations with the Minneapolis Park Board. I'll be submitting that to the secretary for part of the public record. Um, it was a request for the Board of Commissioners to, um, to intervene on around a um, uh, unanimously passed uh, Grievance around our bidding uh, bidding process for our gardeners. Uh, so I will submit that to Secretary Ringel as part of the record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Pass. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Hassan. Pass. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Pass. Uh, Commissioner French. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, drop, touch on two different things. One, one of them, I wanted to uh, mirror uh, Commissioner, Commissioner, Commissioner Bourne uh, in, in his, in his, in his uh, effort to uh, advocate for some fair fairness when it comes to labor disputes. Uh, I think the park board has been a place where folks who can have a job and raise a family and have good salaries and good benefits. We need to we need to make sure that we, we, we continue that effort and that tradition here at our park board and and, and practicing best best practices when we're when we're uh, negotiating with our with our labor. Uh, also oh, I forgot what else I was saying. Oh, I forgot. That's right. Uh okay, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Thank you, um, President Coquille. Um, Yes, I'd like to report, um, I think I might have mentioned this before, but People for Parks um, has been officially brought into the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. Um, I'm very excited about that. You know, I was on it <clears throat> some years ago. Um, this is a really unbelievably viable organization, and the fact that they're collaborating, I think, is um, um, very commendable on the foundation's behalf. Uh, the foundation did have a fundraiser and it was very successful at that. Um, and that will be basically covering their um, overhead um, types of things. Um, they are um, what just a um, li little bit over $400,000 shy of completing the waterworks uh, fundraising. Um, hurrah, hurrah, thank you for um, all of those efforts and any way we can, anybody can push, you know, that the finish line would be marvelous. 
Um, also, um, uh, People for Parks received a bequest um, of some $400,000. It's very, um, uh, what's the word, donor intent is very, um, directive is very specific. Um, but it's amazing. It just, it, it just warms me to know that people are continuing to um, believe in our parks um, and putting in as their legacy. Um, the woman was Marianne Feldman, who was the, um, she authored all of the um, music notes uh, for the Minnesota Orchestra. So who would have thought that, you know, somebody who was, her music was her um, passion and everything would be leaving something so um instrumental, you know, for um, our park system. And then lastly, I wanted to um, FYI everybody that the annual um, Posters for Parks fundraiser is going to be um, on, um, uh, <laughs> excuse me, October, yeah, October 17th from 7 to 8. It's going to be a Zoom um, uh, uh, event and everything, so please put it on your calendar. Um, and participate in it. Um, you can, I believe, beforehand, if you would like to um, purchase any posters, you could do that um, ahead of time, you know, whatever. Um, and so it doesn't have to be just for the seven to eight. Um, so thank you, thank you, um, uh, People for Parks and the Minneapolis Park Formation for your support. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Vice President Vita. Um, thank you, uh, President Cogill. Um, I just wanted to speak to um, a matter uh, that, uh, so originally there was some information put out there that wasn't correct, but has since been corrected around uh, Park Board leadership speaking to the NAACP at the request for a meeting. Um, I just want to go on public record saying that uh, President Cogill, myself, and the superintendent met with uh, President uh, Leslie Redman and other leadership from the NAACP this previous Friday. I think we had a very productive meeting. Um, the, speaking for myself, I was confused at what the meeting was about because the email that I received talked about um, things that possibly took place before I was a board member. And so I was happy to have conversations with the NAAP, NAACP about the work that is currently happening at the Minneapolis Park Board and more than excited to work with them about moving forward uh, around the issues of equity and, and inclusion uh, with the NAACP at the Park Board's table. So um, just wanted to clarify that we have had a meeting with the NAACP uh, it was the first of what I expect to be many meetings with their leadership and uh, the board. Uh, but President Cogill and I definitely plan to come back and report to the board conversations that we're having. And as I said, this time around, there's nothing to report back. It was just really talking through uh, where we are right now. Um, yeah, so that, that was the first thing. Definitely wanted to clear that up. And then also, I received the certified letter at around 4.30 today uh, from Tony Kelly, and I reached out to him and asked for a meeting to get a better understanding of uh, what he's referring to directly in the letter. Uh, so I'm hoping to meet with him really soon and uh, talk to my colleagues on the board or staff or whomever I need to um, after the meeting with him. That's it for me, President Kogil. Thank you, Vice President Vita. Um, I uh, just had a couple of things to, to touch on. Um, I wanted to note that Commissioner Severson did let me know that he was going to be absent this evening due to some other uh, work um, uh, uh, issues that uh, came up uh, to take up his time. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, just uh, provide a, a brief update on the BET. Um, the uh, hearing, uh, public hearing on uh, the setting of the maximum tax levy was held uh, today, which is the reason for my tardiness. Um, there were no speakers, um, and uh, the vote for setting that tax levy is to be held on 
the 23rd, um, though from some uh, BET members there was concern due to the fact that a complete budget um, from the mayor's office has not yet been provided. Um, though I do expect that uh, the mayor's office will provide that uh, in time and we will be able to uh, vote on setting the maximum levy, uh, which does need to happen before September the 30th. Um, and then I also just wanted to note and say thank you to planning staff for uh, getting that RFQ out for the refractory building at uh, Bidet Makoska. Uh, it's great to see that even with everything going on, we're moving forward with some key items um, around uh, the rebuilding of that site um, at what is really the epicenter of the, the busiest area of the entire park system. Um, with that, I will adjourn the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and turn it over to Chair Forney uh, for the Administration and Finance Committee. Thank you. We don't need to have a call. Okay, so um, I'd like to <laughs> uh, convene the Administration and Finance Committee um, here. My goodness. Whoa, 641. Yahoo. <laughs> Would the Secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner French. Here. Vice Chair Hassan. Here. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All those in favor. Oh. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Here. Aye. Chair Musich. Aye. You have five ayes. Chair Forney. I'm sorry. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five. You have five eyes. Great. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of uh, Wednesday, September second, twenty twenty. So moved. Uh, Secretary, would you please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Great. We have only one action item. If somebody would move the resolution 2020-306. I'd like to move resolution 2020-306, a resolution approving a donation between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and Blake School regarding security camera materials and installation at the Parade Park parking lot. Thank you. Um, would we like to have a presentation on this? Any questions on it? I'm sorry, I'm not looking to see if we have any hands. No hands. Oh, yes. Um, Commissioner Musich. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to verify that what's being donated works with all of the other security cameras we have throughout the system and that that we'll be able to monitor them in the same way that we do um, the existing equipment. Somebody staff there to answer that question? Chair Forney, uh, Commissioner Musich, Commissioners, this is Dan Elias, um, project manager for this project. Uh, to answer your question, um, Commissioner Musich, yes, this is going to be provided by the same vendor that uh, manages our uh, security camera systems throughout the park system. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate the information. And I see uh, Commissioner French is stand up. Uh, Chair, Chair Fani, uh, uh Commissioner Musich just asked the same question I was going to ask, so thank you. So. <laughs> okay. Well, Dan, <laughs> you answered all the questions. So uh, just, you know, to affirm that, you know, this is uh, already um, 
all of this work is being uh, done. Um, and so it will be, you know, an add on to the, the greater project. And I appreciate, thank you, Blake School, or as I know them, Northrop, <laughs> anyway, um, for your donation. Um, so, um, Secretary, would you please call the roll? Vice President. Oh, wait a second. I'm assuming, Commissioner French, you didn't have to have any more to say. Your hand's still up. Okay, sorry. Aye. Thanks. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five eyes. I then um, adjourn the admin and finance committee before seven o'clock. Yahoo! Everybody have a wonderful evening. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Kurt. I don't know what I'm doing. Bye, guys. The sun's still up. <laughs> Thanks, all. Have, have a good, good night. Have a good night. Bye. Goodbye.